Hey there, Magic Gang. How you been? This is Glenn Bishop, Magic, and much more. Today we're going to talk a little bit about magic history, and we're going to talk about the book Expert at the Card Table. This is the Di Vernon version of the Expert at the Card Table. He renamed it Revelations. And there's uh, the Expert at the Card Table on the uh, dust cover here. This book was originally published in 1902, and the author was S.W. Erdnase. And the original title that it was published under in 1902 was Artificial Ruse and Subterfuge at the Card Table. Now the interesting thing about this book is nobody knows who published it and nobody knows who S.W. Erdnase was. S.W. Erdnase spelled backwards uh, spells out to E.S. Andrews, which is a lot of people believe that his real name was E.S. Andrews, and he basically turned his name around backwards and published as S.W. Erdnase. Anyway, a lot of people believe that. And the interesting thing is, this was published in 1902, and this version, Revelations, if you uh, take a close-up of one of these pictures here, which is shuffling, uh, there was a person that drew these pictures from life in 1902, and his name was M.D. Smith. That's quite interesting that M.D. Smith went to a magic convention, and uh, Martin Gardner found him and brought him to a magic convention in Chicago, and M.D. Smith gave the first description ever of Erdnase. And he was uh, basically, at this particular time in 1902, he was a young man that wasn't very tall. He was around 5'6", five, 5'5", five, five, maybe 5'7". Five, and M.D. Smith drew these pictures of Erdnay's hands, and these pictures are pictures from life. So he's the only person that magicians ever had at a magic convention that basically was able to describe what Erdnay's looked like and what kind of person he was. There's quite a lot of illustrations in the book and this version Revelations as you can basically see has the original text of Erdnay's here and then here it has Di Vernon's opinions about what Erdnay's is writing and trying to tell you about. Now the interesting thing about this particular book is most magicians think it was S.W. Erdnays was a card cheat, and his real name was E.S. Andrews, and the reason he published it as S.W. Erdnays was that he didn't want other card treat cheats getting upset at him, seeking him out, and basically inflicting bodily harm on him because he was supposedly giving away the secrets of the card cheats. Anyway, uh, the second half of the book is magic. Okay, so it's two completely different things in one book, and magic and card cheating. And the interesting thing is the magic is in the back part of the book, and the card cheating is in the front part of the book. Okay, but most people think that Erdnays was a professional card cheat. And it's quite interesting because when you actually read some of the text, it is very interesting that Erdnase probably was a guy who played cards at time. The other thing that I have found interesting about the book, and I've discussed this with Di Vernon himself, I've discussed it with people like Jay Marshall, I've discussed it with people like my father, who was the late Billy Bishop, and Billy Bishop was quite a poker player. But most of the real performers in magic that actually did shows think that Erdnase was a magician. Other people think that he was a professional card cheat. 
So we're going to get into a little bit of the philosophy and a little bit of what I feel about who Erdnase was or what type of guy he was. And we're going to start with the beginning part of the book where the book is published and the reason Erdnase gave for publishing the book was that he said he needed the money. In my opinion, publishing it for that particular reason shows me that Erdnase was not a card sheet. And here's my philosophy and reason that I don't believe Erdnase was a card sheet. Well, he comes up with a method of bottom dealing in this particular book. All sorts of different cuts, single cuts, how to do shuffling on the table, how to do shuffling in your hands, poker stacking. And this is the bottom deal, technically, of what he's doing. If you could come a close up here and you can basically see his hands, He's dealing cards, okay, and uh, that particular grip is called the Erdnase grip, which basically means he invented it, okay, and the real interesting thing about this particular grip is I've never seen a professional card sheet use it, and my father never saw a professional card sheet use it, and most people look at this particular grip because it's unorthodox. Most people don't believe that professional card sheets ever use this grip to actually bottom deal cards. So I always found that kind of interesting because a bottom deal can be done with several different kinds of grips. But getting on with the, 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 the reason that I believe that uh, Erdnase was not a card sheet is because if he needed the money. Well, let's look at the particular time. This is 1902. 1902 was way back in the days of the wild, wild west, okay? We're talking about most towns had a saloon of some kind, and inside the saloon there was gambling, okay? If Erdnase, the man who invented his own version of the bottom deal, the man who basically came up with different ways of stacking, or as he says, stocking cards, a man who came up with his own version of doing the shift, which magicians also call the pass. This person, supposedly, and if you look at this particular book, who basically recorded all these slights, invented some of them according to the, what's written in the actual text. Okay, This book was the super card sheet of all card sheets or not necessarily card sheet, but he'd be the super card manipulator. And here he does, records all this stuff in a book, and the reason for publishing the book was that he needed the money, okay? Well, it's 1902, there's a saloon in most towns, and if you were this good with a deck of cards, you wouldn't need the money. You could easily get in on a game. Games were everywhere. They didn't have certain gambling restrictions in towns back in those days. Basically, every saloon, most of them had gambling, okay? And then the second thing is, as vaudeville was going on and other different forms of theater, this was 1902, okay? And the whole thing is, is that people used to play cards in between the vaudeville shows, and this would be the crew. So if this guy, Erdnase, couldn't find a game in a saloon, he could have easily found it, uh, gotten a, a, a job as a maintenance person in a vaudeville theater, and could have easily gotten in on other card games while they played in vaudeville. It's a matter of interest that my father came out of that vaudeville era. He was a professional magician who did vaudeville and nightclubs. He performed in vaudeville and nightclubs. And he basically said that there was a card game going on pr pretty much almost all the time while the vaudeville theater was open. So he basically got me interested in playing cards. And the reason was, was because agents and show business people played cards. And if you want to schmooze with an agent, the easiest way to do it would be get in a card game with a bunch of show business people, and there you go. 
lose a few hands, drop $20, lose 20 bucks, and you're smooching with the people in show business that could get you more shows. And that's the reason he played cards. But anyway, card games were not hard to find back in 1902. Saloons, theaters, cards were played all over. So basically, his basically the basic idea of him wanting to publish this book because he needed the money was because he probably was not a card sheet. The text seems to suggest that he gambled a little bit, but he was not a card sheet. The interesting thing is, too, he talks about the street con three-card money somewhere later in this book, and that's just before the magic section, and three-card money is demonstrated in the actual text, it's the, the text reads as if the person doing three card money was a performer doing it for an audience. Okay, now that's very important because I've seen three card money played on the streets. I've done lectures on three card money. I've also uh, done three card money as the show. And basically, most magicians that do three card money, they basically do it almost exactly as Erdnase describes it in the book. Most of them do it that way. And it's not described the way an actual street person on the streets would do three card money. Because most three card money people, they basically travel with a mob. And the mob's job was to. Uh, find the card before the the money person and or the person that was betting money on which one is the queen or which one is the ace depending on whether they're using the queen or the ace as a hot card well basically what would happen is, is and here's the illustration on three card money if you come in close there's the figure right there that's three card money the actual description reads exactly like as if a magician was doing it as a demonstration to entertain people rather than uh, take people's money away from them, okay? So basically, the three cards are thrown out on the table, and uh, they basically bet on which one is the queen, and basically that's how the game is played. And if you bet right, you get money. If you bet wrong, you lose money. Now, the reason for the mob was to protect the tosser. Okay, and protecting the tosser is the tosser would signal which one is the money card. Okay, so for example, if the uh, queen ends up on the right hand side, he'd put his right hand on the table like that. I'm going to put it on the book. Okay, and if the left hand side was the money card, they'd signal and put the left hand on the table to let the mob know where it was. And if the money card was in the center, okay, he'd basically have both hands off the table. Now the reason for that is, is that if they didn't want the guy to win, okay, they basically would signal the mob, okay, it's on the right hand side. And if the guy would uh, guess the right hand side, one of the mob people would move in and disrupt, disrupt the game, okay? So no money would be tossed out, okay? So basically, the three-card money toss here would not lose money. And then there's other reasons for the mob, too, because they basically move up behind the person, that they, they, the, the, the sucker that they want to bet on the game, and they basically make it hard for him to leave the table because they get him really close and they would have to move out of the way and they want that guy to bet money. So there's other reasons for the mob, okay? But this, basically, as it reads, is basically of a single person doing it as a demonstration, and he's basically doing it in front of a small group of people, and no one is betting, okay? So we're gonna go, now, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the book Revelations. I'm gonna close the book and put it in front of you, and we're gonna get close up on the cards, okay? So basically, I talked about the Erdnase grip, okay? There are several different gambling grips that, that, that are used. I'm a professional magician, 
and I have never used any of these techniques to cheat in a card game. Okay, the first grip I said is the Erdnay's grip. The grip is held between the middle finger and right in here, this section right here of your hand. Okay, so it's the middle finger and this section right here, okay? So basically the grip is like this, okay? And the reason for the grip like this is so that you could use this finger here to manipulate the deck of cards, reach underneath the deck of cards, and kick out the bottom card, okay? Then another way is called the straddle grip, and the straddle grip is like this with the first finger in front and the pinky is, in be, be, is behind it, okay? And basically the cards come off the side and you use your right, your right hand to pull the cards out, okay? And then the uh, next grip is called the mechanics grip. And this was explained in the Erdnay's version that Mickey McDougall published. So Mickey McDougall published a book called Card Mastery and it had Erdnay's in front and his techniques and Mickey McDougall was a guy that called himself, he was a magician, but he called himself the card detective. And this is the mechanics grip and the grip is like this with the first finger in front and three fingers on the side and they use the middle finger to push out the bottom card. Okay, and then the last grip was supposedly invented by Walter Scott. Now Walter Scott, excuse me, Walter Scott wrote an interesting book called Phantom of the Card Table and it explained his method of marking cards and using different deals. And Walter Scott's method was this grip here with the first finger on the corner, okay? And that way you could use these three fingers to push out a bottom card, okay? Like that, okay? Or you could use it to do a strike second, which is pull down the card and then hit the card like that, do a strike second. Now the real interesting thing is about the Walter Scott method was supposedly uh, Kardashian Ed Marlowe from Chicago, and I knew Ed Marlowe very well, and Ed Marlowe and I did talk about her names quite a lot. And uh, Ed Marlowe, uh, he supposedly learned that particular grip, and Ed Marlowe published it in a book called Marlowe and Spades, and he called it the Master Grip. And also Marlowe and Spades supposedly had a lot of hidden stuff that was card cheating and the magic in it was inspired by the card cheating techniques of Walter Scott. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Walter Scott a little bit. Now I never met Walter Scott, but Walter Scott supposedly was performing, he was a performer in vaudeville, and he didn't do magic as a performer in vaudeville. He basically said in uh, an interview, uh, who a magician was interviewing him and he basically said that he played Hawaiian guitar and he was part of a band that played Hawaiian music in vaudeville and uh, he basically got into poker games all the time in the back of a vaudeville theater and that basically that vaudeville poker game was really how he was making his money and uh, and that leads me to, to feel that Erdnays was, if he was a card cheat, and I don't think he was because of the way the, the book, Expert at the Card Table, is written. If he was a card cheat, he would have been doing something of the same thing. I do believe that he would be connected in some way to vaudeville theaters, and he probably would have played cards in the vaudeville theater with the rest of the vaudeville crew which is some performers, some agents, some people that would be changing the vaudeville sets, lowering and lifting curtains and all the uh, side jobs that are within the vaudeville theater. The interesting thing about the book that Di Vernon uh, mentioned to me is that 1902, everybody was doing two things. Everybody was doing a move called the spread. Now the spread is something that's interesting because the card is basically palmed in your hand and supposedly it was an ace, okay? 
and basically the card would be palmed in your hand and Somebody says that they have a certain amount of uh, cards on the table and supposedly they have a nine in this particular hand, okay? Okay, so basically he, they'd flip over four cards and they'd say, I got a pair of nines, okay? It doesn't have a nine here, but supposedly, okay? If it had a nine, well, let's give it a nine. Okay, we'll do a pair of fours. Okay. Basically, it would be palmed in the hand like this. And a guy across the table would spread the cards. It, would you just have the cards like this? And he'd say, I have a pair of fours. Okay. And basically, a person would reach across the table and say, let's see those fours, and add the extra four to the hand while the cards were spread, and it was called the spread. Now, of course, it could be done with pretty much every card, every card in the deck, which means you could do it with queens or kings or everything. And basically, people cheated with partners a lot. Well, Di Vernon said something interesting, that in 1902, everybody was spreading Spreading was like one of the major moves people cheated with, okay? Well, Erdnays doesn't mention anything about the spread at all. It's not in the book, not even mentioned, okay? If the spread was that popular and if it was a book actually about actual card cheating methods, it doesn't seem very likely that Erdnays would leave out the spread, but he did, okay? That was a card move in 1902 that was done quite a lot by Di I mean, according to Di Vernon, it was done quite a lot during those times in the early 1900s. And they were spreading. Anyway, I don't believe Erdnays was a card cheat at all. I believe that Erdnays was probably connected to some type of entertainment industry. Okay. And the reason I think he was some type of entertainer, and I think he was a card magician, and he just did cards. Cards was his love. Well, I've had arguments with quite a lot of different magicians over the years, and they said, well, if he was a magician, how come there weren't any posters of Erdnays? How come there weren't, wasn't any publicity? Well, if he was doing card tricks, and he did card tricks, and we know that because... M.D. Smith, the guy who wrote the illustrations, he said that Erdnays showed him several very, very, very intriguing card tricks before they got down to work about drawing the illustrations. Okay? Well, most card cheats don't do card tricks. They just don't. They, card cheats basically want people to think that they have no skill with a deck of cards whatsoever. Because magicians are all the time, people say, hey, I wouldn't play cards with you. Well, if you get a reputation of doing card cheats, and Erdnays did have a reputation of doing card magic, okay, he did, you know. And it's, it's pretty much documented by M.D. Smith that he did in the hotel room in Chicago when he was drawing those illustrations, Erdnays did several card sheets, and he said that at the Chicago Magic Convention when he was there, when Martin Gardner found him. Now, the interesting thing about Martin Gardner is, and I knew Martin Gardner, Martin Gardner thought that Erdnays was, uh, he thought that Erdnays was something that was someone else. He thought that his name was Andrews, and he basically was connected to a a uh, gambler who basically was involved with a double suicide and uh, it was it's a very long story and that's who Martin Gardner thought their names was he was that particular guy I'm not going to mention the guy's full name I'm not going to mention too much about it just because I think it's a complete waste of time uh, 
Erdnes was not that particular guy. Other magicians have claimed that he was and that they knew him and all this kind of stuff. And I do not believe any of that is true. I talked to Jay Marshall about it. He, he said that Martin Gardner really wants his find, the guy that he found, to be Erdnes. So he talked it over with M.D. Smith, Martin Gardner, and Martin Gardner showed him a picture of the guy that he thought was Erdnes, and the guy's taller than the guy that M.D. Smith met. So Erdnes was shorter, okay? The guy that Martin Gardner found was taller. So right there it doesn't make any sense that the, the, they're the same person. So basically, I'm going to sum it up. The back part of the book is magic. The front part of the book is supposedly gambling slights. Most of the gambling slights are written about as if they're doing a demonstration to show what someone thinks is card cheating, like a magician doing it, and this is how you cheat the cards. And, uh, well, it just doesn't add up. There's too many vague questions about who, who Erdnaze is, and the people that want him to be a gambler, well, they will, yeah, he's a gambler. Look at all these gambling slides he came up with. Oh, wow, look at that. Yes, he came up with all these different gambling slides. And then uh, the magician guys, they just look at it and say, well, if he's doing a demonstration, as a uh, bottom deal, and he mentions little words like performer, that really he sets a slant that he didn't really gamble with using card cheating methods. He basically wasn't a card cheat. He was a guy that wrote a book, and I believe he might have been the first guy to be a type of person in a saloon that could have been a guy who was a spotter, okay? So supposedly you write a book on all this card cheating, who are you gonna sell it to besides magicians, okay? The only other people that would be interested in this type of book would be people that own gambling places so that their security division or sheriffs or that type of law enforcement things can actually spot a cheat. So basically, I think he had two customers for that type of, uh, of market. He had magicians, and then he had the people that wanted to know about card cheating so they could spot a cheat in a saloon or a gambling institution. So basically, Erdene's 12-card stock is what he calls it when he's shuffling the deck and running up an entire set of 12 cards, which would be, I think, four hands of poker, okay? First, you have to get the deck in a certain order for it to work. Then second, you put the aces on the bottom, and then you run them up in a hand, okay? That is one of the most ridiculous ways of cheating at cards that I have ever seen in my life. And the reason is, is that if you're going to st uh, stock a hand or stack it and put a deck in a certain order by shuffling cards like this, okay, why would you put it in an order first and then put the four aces on the bottom and then run them up in a stack? And then saying you're stacking the entire deck. That just doesn't make any sense to me. It's great for a demonstration if you're going to do a demonstration, but the thing is is that the, an actual method of cheating. Now, the easy way to do it would be to set the deck up in that certain order that you want everybody to get a good hand and then have either the dealer or your partner get the best hand. Okay, And you do that by doing a cold deck. And that's a deck switch. So basically, the deck is shuffled, okay? And if you remember the movie The Sting, the, uh, the technical director of the techniques used in the movie The Sting, and they're on the train, 
was a magician named John Scarney. So basically, the whole idea was the Paul Newman character, he basically uh, switched his personal hand after the, uh, the villain, so we say, who was cheating at cards, he basically switched the deck. Okay, Now deck switching was done. Erdnays doesn't talk about deck switching either. At deck switching was done in 1902. And that would be the way that the professional gambler would do it. He'd switch the deck on you. He'd bring in a cold deck. And the reason it was called a cold deck was because if you're playing cards for a while, the deck warms up. And basically there's a temperature difference with a deck that's been sitting in your, uh, let's say, hidden on the person. And then they bring the cold de deck in during the cut. So anyway... We're going to sum it up. I do believe that Erdnays was not a card cheat. And uh, just to, to mention just one more thing is that uh, he doesn't mention cold deck. So the two, the two major techniques for uh, winning at the card table and cheating at the card table, which is the spread and the cold deck, they basically aren't even mentioned in the book x at the card table. Okay, so if it's a treatise on cheating, it neglected to mention the two, two very popular methods. So I don't believe Erdnays was a card cheat. I think he was a person that did magic as an amateur magician. And he basically wrote a book to get his name out there. And basically, he basically uh, fell into obscurity and nobody knows who he is. Because I know a lot of magicians that nobody knows who they are. And I'm probably one of them. Anyway, this is Glenn Bishop. The station is Magic and Much More. And I thank you for your time. And if you like the video, hit the like button, hit the bell button. And if you disagree with me at one point, tell me about it in the, in the uh, suggestions and uh, the, the comments. So, thank you very much.